God, you are so good. Lord, we have felt your presence in this place today, and we believe that it's going to continue, God, through the bringing of your word, that as we open our hearts to what your word has, that your word will always change and transform us from the inside out. And so we do that this morning, God. We are open to you for change. We praise you, God, in all things in Jesus' name. Everybody set? Amen. Amen. January the 7th, 2017, was the day that changed my family's life. This week marks four years since that day when my family and this church body made a commitment to each other. I promised, among other things on that day, that I would lead our church community to the very best of my ability. And you guys promised, among other things on that day, that you would have a lot of grace on a 29-year-old kid that really didn't know what he was doing all the time. I believe that we've both done a pretty good job keeping our promises. Since that day, there have been 209 Sundays. That means that I have prepared about 200 messages, not counting Wednesday nights. And I say all that to say this. I have prepared and I've written a lot over the last four years that I've been the pastor here at Wellspring. And messages always seem to develop one of two ways. The first is they, they just flow from beginning to end. It is so smooth. There have actually been Sunday nights, Sunday evenings before where I had my message completely done for the next week already. You just sit down with the scripture and the Holy Spirit speaks and I just start typing and I type until it's done and everything goes super smooth. We really like the weeks where everything goes smooth. Amen, Pastor Brad? Pastor Brad knows what I'm talking about. He writes messages every week. We like it whenever it goes smooth. The second way, though, is that I labor and I work and I pray and I write and then I delete and then I pray and I study and I think and I pray some more and I'm still staring at a blank screen. This series that we're starting today is one of this kind. Without going into all the details, I like to have a plan for my messages and a plan for the series that we're going to be doing. And I pray over it and I work through where I believe God is taking our church and where he wants us to go in the word over that year. Sometimes the plan changes, but the Holy Spirit and I always sit down together and develop a plan that I can work from. I currently have a message plan through the end of the summer of this year. So for about the next six months, I have a rough message plan about where we're going. And so I have six months worth, but I could not get a handle on what we were going to do for the next three weeks starting today. The only way that I can explain it is when the right thing hits my spirit I just know it and I have a peace about it and that hadn't happened yet for the next three weeks and Thursday of this week came and nothing had connected with my spirit yet we have a process for how all of this media happens and all the graphics and the lights and everything that needs to happen for a Sunday does happen and that process calls for me to be ready much earlier than Thursday on the week of knowing that Sunday was coming and I was going to stand here and speak to you guys, I began to prepare a message on Thursday. It still didn't feel right. It didn't hit the right spiritual spot, but it was the Word of God, and I thought if I was going to stand up in front of you guys, it would be better to give you the Word of God than just to stand here and look at each other. Amen? So I began to prepare a message. Our family went to Memphis yesterday. We usually don't travel on Saturdays because uh, I don't like to be out real late on Saturdays. I like to be rested for Sundays, but we needed the family time, and it was a great day, and so we went. For most of the day, I was internally wrestling with what was going to happen here right now. I can't describe to you the burden that I feel each week as I stand behind God's Word and attempt to speak to you on his behalf. I'm certainly not 
complaining about it. There's nothing else that I would rather be doing with my life. As the Apostle Paul said, I will gladly spend and be spent for this church. I'm just trying to let you into my mind a little bit. I know that that's scary for some of you guys. I'm just trying to let you into my mind a little bit so that maybe you can understand when I say that there's almost never a time when at least in the back of my mind I'm not thinking about something that has to do with our church, most often this message every week. And what we were just about to come across the bridge, we were on, coming across on the pyramid side, we were just about to come across the bridge on the way home yesterday afternoon when the Holy Spirit dropped, dropped three words of a scripture into my spirit, if my people... And I began to, as he began to download in me these ideas and scriptures and promises into my spirit, it didn't take me very long to realize that this wasn't a message for a later time, but this was the message that I had been waiting on. Not just a message, but a series for the next three weeks that I had struggled for so long to get peace with. And it was like he was asking me, even if it doesn't fit your timeline, will you still trust me? Because I'm being totally transparent with you. Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, the Holy Spirit dropping a new message in my spirit does not fit my timeline. I am not comfortable with that. And it was like he was testing me, will you still trust me? Will you still trust? follow me and so I told him that I would and he downloaded this series into my spirit this series is called if my people and it's about the church's response to cultural chaos now if you've been here for very long you know that I don't often chase cultural messages meaning just because something is happening in our society right now I don't feel the need to preach on that exact thing in this Moment, But the time that I had with the Holy Spirit yesterday was different, and I knew straight away what the series was going to be about. Our culture right now is in complete chaos. It hasn't just started, but it seems to be at an all-time high. And the church should have a response to the chaos of culture. Amen? We should have a response to the chaos that's going on all around us. For too long, the church has sat silently in the corner while we watch the world burn down around us. I'm not talking about engaging in the processes that are causing all the mess. I'm talking about engaging where the fight is actually happening, and that is in the spiritual. The church has to stand up, and not for a political party, and not for a policy decision. The church has to stand in the middle of the chaos and not point people to Trump and not point people to Biden. The church has to start pointing people to Jesus again. We should have a response to the cultural chaos that's happening all around us, and our response should be that we point people to the cross. So what is our response? What's the response to the chaos of culture? Our response is simply to stand. Ephesians 6 says, when you've done everything that God told you to do, when you've got completely ready for the battle, then you go into battle. And Ephesians 6 says, when you've done everything that you know to do, just stand firm. So what do we do when the cultural foundations are shaking violently beneath us well it's the same thing that we do when there's cultural peace culture does not dictate my peace because culture does not give me my peace because my life is not rooted in the foundation of culture culture can't take it because culture didn't give it Culture comes from standing on Christ, the solid rock. As the song says, all other ground, everything else is sinking sand except for Jesus Christ. There is not a politician that can handle my peace. There isn't a policy solution that can handle my peace peace there isn't enough money to give me peace there's not the right job that I can find to give me peace there's only one way to peace and it comes through the prince of peace Jesus Christ 
When everything else is shaking all around us, we have to stand firm on Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith. So what does that look like practically? Because it sounds really good in spiritualese. We're so good at spiritualese in the church. And we can say some of the most spiritual things that probably freak people out who don't go to church. Have you been washed in the blood? Washed in the blood? That sounds awful. We're so good at church talk. So we say things like, just stand on Jesus. Just stand firm on the solid rock. Well, what in the world does that mean? Jesus isn't here. There's nothing for me to stand on. What can I actually do tomorrow that's going to help me? How do we stand on Jesus? John 1, 1 through 5 is speaking about Jesus when it says, In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him, that's still Jesus, in Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. How do we stand on Jesus? We stand on God's Word. And I have good news today. His Word is full of promises for you. When culture is telling you how bad things are, and that there is no peace, and that there is no joy, and that there is no love, and that there is no hope, you have to be like David. See, in the Old Testament, David led a band of misfits. It was like the island of misfit toys. David led this band of misfits, and there was one point where they went into battle, and they came back to camp, and somebody had raided their camp, destroyed the whole thing, taken all of their wives and all of their children. And so his men were ready to turn on him. They were ready to kill him. And we find in 1 Samuel 30, verse number 6, what David's response to this was. It says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Another version says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. We have too many followers of Jesus who mature believers in Christ by this point in their walk with Jesus, but they still don't know how to encourage themselves in the Lord. They don't know how to stand on God's perfect promises, mostly because they're biblically illiterate and they don't know the promises that they can stand on. Ooh. So when culture's up, they're up. And when culture's down, they're down. They've made culture their God. We're in a cultural mess right now, and the answer to the mess isn't going to be found inside of it. We have to stop looking for social and political answers to spiritual problems. And make no doubt about it, that is exactly what we have. All of the cultural mess that we see ultimately boils down to that America is post-Christian. That means after-Christian. It means that we're not a Christian nation anymore. We've abandoned God. We have a spiritual problem. God's word is full of promises for you. You have to learn them. You have to stand on them. We need mature believers who are willing to stand on the promises of God no matter what is happening in culture. It may seem like a simple solution, just standing on the promises of God, just praying and believing that God will be God and he'll take care of you. In fact, it may sound too simple sometimes, so simple that we feel like we need to add some political post on social media to go along with the provision of God but until the church stops posting about it and starts praying about it culture will never come out of the death spiral that it's in right now 
God is not just one of the answers to the chaos. He is the answer to the chaos. He is the only answer to the chaos that consumes our culture today. We have to be people who are standing on the promises of God. I want to be an encouragement to you today. So today we're going to talk about just a few of the promises of God that we find for you as a follower of Jesus that apply to your life in his word. This is what you get when your life is secured to the firm foundation of Jesus. Are you ready? Promise number one, God is faithful. Oh man, that's so good. God is faithful. You know, it's easy to stand on this promise when everything's going just right. When the temperature's just right, when your guy won the election, it's easy to say, well, the faithfulness of God, look, the faithfulness of God abounds. And if we're not careful, we'll reduce God down to the size of whatever's going on in our lives. But no matter what is going on, this truth still remains. God is still faithful. We see in Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah is writing a lament. That's why it's called Lamentations. Lament is defined as a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And Jeremiah is looking back on what had become of Judah after the Jews were conquered and exiled by the Babylonians. And Lamentation, Lamentations 1 says things like, Jerusalem once so full of people, is now deserted. She who was once great among nations now sits alone like a widow. Her oppressors have become her masters, and her enemies prosper. Have you ever felt like that before? Okay, just me and Maddie Hickson. We're the two in the room who felt like that. Like the people who don't even claim to be following Jesus are getting everything that you want and they're attacking you and they're lying about you and they're cutting you down and your enemies are prospering. Okay, well, Jeremiah felt that way. Her enemies prosper. For the Lord has punished Jerusalem for her many sins. Her children have been captured and taken away to distant lands. She defiled herself with immorality and gave no thought to her future. Now she lies in the gutter with no one to lift her out. It's a lament. It's passionately sorrowful. It's an incredibly heartfelt, passionate cry about God's people and what had become of them. And then we get to Lamentations 3. This is the part of Lamentations that everybody likes. Lamentations 3. We look at verses 19 through 26. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words, Jeremiah says. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. And then everything in Lamentations turns on Lamentations 3, verse number 21, and the first word is yet. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. So what is it that gives Jeremiah hope in the middle of grief that will not even allow him to speak? That's what he says in verse 19. This is bitter beyond words. I can't even put into words how awful my life is, yet I still have hope. What gives Jeremiah hope in the middle of what was a cultural mess? Verse 22 for the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in who? In Him. The Lord is good to those who depend on Him, to those who search for Him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. In the middle of disaster and devastation and disease the lord's faithfulness never failed and jeremiah found hope in the faithfulness and in the love of god in the faithfulness of god 
that was there for Jeremiah. See, we serve a God who's never changing. He's immutable. He cannot change. So if God was faithful for Jeremiah, that means that God will be faithful for me. If God was faithful in the middle of a mess for Jeremiah, that means that God will be faithful in the middle of your mess. His love will never fail you. His love will never give up on you. Even when you're in the midst of failure, even when you're struggling, even when you feel like you've been conquered and exiled, even when it's so bad that you can't put words to it, the perfect and precious love of God will never fail. God is still greater. His mercies are still new for us every single day. The Lord is good to those who depend on and search for Him. What a God! What a promise that we have. Come hell or high water. Come Republicans or Democrats. Come money or poverty. Come COVID or cure. I don't know what the future holds, but I guarantee you that our God has already been there and He will be 100% faithful through it all. His love never fails. His love never gives up on me, even when that's what I deserve. I can't use his mercies up because every day I wake up and there's a fresh batch for me. God is still faithful. Our second promise for the day, oh, I love this one. In our weakness, he is strong in our weakness he is strong singing this song to Judah the other night Jesus loves me yes Jesus loves me the Bible tells me so they are weak but he is strong and whenever he got to that line he had a problem with it because pretty much every night of his entire life when I've gone in to pray with Judah, one of the things that I've prayed over him is that he is strong. He believes it's a part of who he is, that he is strong. So when I got to the part that said, we are weak, but he is strong, he said, wait, Dad, am I weak? And I knew there was no way I could explain it in a way that his five-year-old mind could understand it. And so I just said, well, compared to God, we're all weak. But what I hope to teach him as he grows and is able to understand it is that weakness is not something to shy away from. Because, son, in the places of life where you are the absolute weakest, God has promised to show up and put himself in that place and be the absolute strongest. When I am weak, then he is strong. Paul's writing a letter to the church in Corinth, and apparently there were some problems with some people, specifically teachers, trying to one-up each other spiritually. Everyone trying to seem more spiritual than the next person. And Paul is trying to set that straight. So in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul addresses this. See, what they were doing was they were talking about, well, I've seen this vision from God. And then another one said, well, I've seen even a more lofty vision from God. And God has used me in this way. And God has used me to heal this many people. And then somebody would one-up them. Don't you hate getting in conversations with people like that? God blessed me with $100 this week. Well, God blessed me with 1000 Take that somewhere else. But that's what was happening spiritually. They were trying to one-up each other. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, when he hears about this, he says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. 
And then he goes on to give evidence about how he is more of a servant for Christ. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So what is Paul saying? If you want to compare resumes, I win. And he wasn't doing this to brag. He was doing it to make a point. And he finishes making that point in 2 Corinthians 12, verse number 7, about halfway through. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was giving a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Here's the, pow- here's the promise, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So what does Paul do with that? He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's the promise for you today. When you are at your absolute weakest, God is at his absolute strongest in your life. You don't have to have all of your stuff together to follow Jesus. You don't have to have 25 scriptures memorized. To follow Jesus. You don't have to dress just right. You don't have to come to church for five years. You don't have to give in the offering before God will let you into the family. You can just come today exactly like you are. Flaws and all. Mess and all. Baggage and all. Issues and all. And the promise of God is that in the places where you are weak, then you will be strong. God is fighting for you. God is on your side. He wants you to win. And your your imperfections do not disqualify you from being used by God. In fact, it's just the opposite. Your imperfections uniquely qualify you to be used by God. If you were good at it, you wouldn't rely on God to do it. Because you know that you're bad at it, you know that God either has to show up or the entire thing's going to come crashing down around you. Something funny about me, whenever I was growing up, my least favorite class in school, guess what it was? Speech class. I hated public speaking. I would just as soon jump out of a perfectly good airplane than stand up in front of 15 of my classmates and give a five-minute speech. Now my ministry, my life, the way that I provide for my family consists a great deal of standing in front of people and talking. Don't you know that God planned it that way? Don't you know that when he uniquely designed me, that he put that in me? Because if I felt like I was strong in that area, I wouldn't have to rely on God as much. But because I know that I'm weak in that area, I'm completely reliant upon God. Because God, if you don't show up, this thing is going to be an absolute disaster. And in the areas of my life where I am the weakest, that's actually where God uses me to be the strongest for the kingdom. Psalm 24 tells us about the God who is on our side. Verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Verse 7 says, Lift up your head, you gates. Be 
lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. What does that tell us about God? It tells us that God is strong and mighty, and he will show up in the middle of your weakness and do what only he can do. The final promise that I want to share today is the promise of this series. It's the promise that God dropped in my spirit yesterday for our church. It's the promise that can save us during cultural chaos. 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 and 14, God is speaking to King Solomon after they've dedicated the temple. And God says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. Verse 14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Our final promise for the day is the promise of this series. It's not too late for God to heal our land. Over the last year, there have been several times where I watched as culture shifted, and it did not make me proud. My spirit has been grieved as I've watched culture turn on each other and dig into polarizing preferences as both sides have validated and justified violence and pain and even death in the name of their cause. We're living in the most culturally chaotic time of my life. But God is still sitting on the throne. He's still in control. He's still omnipotent. And you're going to see our role in his promise over the next two weeks for this promise. But I just wanted to remind you today because I guarantee you the news isn't going to do it. They need you to be afraid. Do like this if you know that that's true. They need you to be afraid. That's how they make all that money. So they're not going to tell you that there's still hope, that there's still a way. His name is Jesus. It may look bad right now. Maybe like the devastated streets of Jerusalem that Jeremiah was mourning over in Lamentations. Yet I find hope in the love and the mercy and the faithfulness of God. It may seem like as a nation we're weak right now. But I'm praying that our weakness causes us to turn back to God. And our post-Christian nation that was once under God would turn back to Him. And in our weakness, we would find that His strength was actually all that we needed the entire time. God, we stand on Your promises. We know that You are faithful. We know that you are strong. We know that you are I am. That means that whatever I need God to be, he will be that thing at the exact moment that I need him to be that. And for our part, whether it be our actions or our apathy, we will repent and pray the faithful, perfect promises of God over our lives. My challenge to you this week is really simple. Live a victorious life in the middle of a defeated culture. You're a son and a daughter of the Most High God. What if we lived this week like the battle wasn't ours to win, but the battle belonged to God and it had already been won? God's promises aren't predicated on culture. 
That means the promises that we talked about today, it doesn't matter what's going on around, these promises are still true. God is still faithful. Mighty God is still powerful and on your side and fighting for you and wants you to win. He's still stronger no matter what. And it's not too late for our nation. He can heal our land. So let's walk in the victory that God has promised us we can have. I'm excited about the next two weeks as we get in and talk about what our role is as the church. See, the title of the series is If My People, not if those people. Not if all the sinners would stop acting like sinners. Man, us church people get it so twisted sometimes. We go into a culture that is all but completely void of God and expect them to act like they're not what they are. God didn't say, when everybody turns back to me, everybody turns back to me. When everybody calls on my name, then I'll heal. No, he said, if my people, the hard truth over the next two weeks is that this is our fault. Y'all may not come back the next two weeks. Is that we're the ones who stop praying. Is that we're the ones who stop seeking. It's not that the sinners aren't seeking God. Why would they be expected to do that? It's if my people who are called by my name, that's us. If we would change, then he will come back and heal our land. We have the control. Let's pray. Forgive us, God. Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. For our inaction, for our wrong actions, for our apathy. We stand on your promises today, God. That you are still faithful. Oh, that you're still strong. That you're still for us. That when I'm weak, that's actually when I'm strong. God, if I find any pride in my life, let it be found in the places where I am the weakest. Heal our land. God, chaos abounds. Sin abounds. Devastation, disease abounds. But you're bigger, you're stronger. And you're still faithful. So heal our land, Lord. Be God. Do what only you can do. As we turn back to you. Well, nobody looking around for just a moment. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God. See, the thing about the promises of the Word of God is that they're reserved for people who are a part of the family of God. See, as a son and daughter of God, we have high privileges in the family of God. Maybe you've been trying to do life on your own. It just hasn't been going that great. 
I guarantee you life with God is better. It's not perfect. We're guaranteed of that. But I'll take the trials of life with God than the very best day without Him. Everybody stand with me real quick. If you're here this morning and that's you and you don't have a relationship with God, but you want to begin following Him with your life, Christians are praying. Nobody's looking around right now for just a moment. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you down. We just want to pray with you this morning. We want to let you know that you're not alone, that we're doing life together, that we're doing spiritual journey together. We'll wait for just a moment. Anybody? You're so good, Lord. Your promises are good and they're for us. And we stand on them this morning. Hallelujah. Everybody look at me this morning. This is the way we're going to close today. I asked Pastor Chris and the team to sing this song. It's called Promises. And it says, Great is your faithfulness, O God. See, we've seen what God's word had to say about his promises. And now through worship, we're going to solidify it in our hearts. We're going to solidify it in our souls that we serve a grateful God who is not only not against us, but he is for us. And in our weakness, that is where we can find our greatest strength in him. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. This is how we're going to end our service this morning. Let's worship together. Just 